So actually, it's myself. Um, we also have Ted Southern with Final Frontier Design. And we have Matt Reyes here with uh, the Ames Research Center. He's a contractor supporting them and a lot of the making work that they're doing. So um, I guess what we want to talk about today is, again, the, the aspects of, let's go back. There we go. So we're going to talk a little bit today about the aspects of how makers, hackers, hobbyists, citizen inventors, academia, non-academia, anybody, everybody who has an interest in creating high technology or low technology even to solve problems that NASA has. Um, how do you get engaged? How do you do that? Um, how do you get engaged in the citizen science of space exploration? You know, some of the things that Matt will address. Um, so we're gonna talk a little bit about that. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, Ted's experience and what he's been able to do coming out of, uh, the, going through that path through what NASA can offer. Um, and then we'll, we'll go on and explore a little bit more of just about the other aspects of uh, citizen science capabilities we have. So I've been with NASA now for uh, 27 years. I've worked very multiple different areas, but by far this has probably been one of the most fun locations that I've been today here at Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama. And I do the Centennial Challenges program. So the focus there that we have, and as you can see, is dream it, make it, win it. And we try to advance technologies for NASA and space exploration through prize competitions. So I have the option. I could put out a multi-million dollar contract for somebody to build me an autonomous robot that can do some tasks, tasks that we're looking for. Or I take a portion of that money, I hold it up in the air, and I say, anybody that can do it, bring it on. We'll have a competition. And if you meet the goals and objectives, we'll award you that prize money. So if I go to the first route with the contract, uh, I would get one solution. Um, it would hopefully come in on, on schedule and on budget. And that's the end. When I do a prize competition now, I take a, a smaller fraction of money. I get multiple solutions to choose from. And then I can go off and choose and pick what I'd like. And I only have to pay if they achieve the goals that we're looking for. So even if nobody ever, sets, or nobody ever meets those goals and objectives, we have that technology, we can bring it in and infuse it into NASA. We're very critical about how we design and fabricate our competitions and challenges because we want to make sure that that competition will develop technology that not only, not only helps NASA in space exploration efforts, but it has a terrestrial application so that a participant can go off, create a business model from it, and start a company that would have more than just a one-off contract with NASA. They can go off and do greater things within the commercial industry and to be able to do um, uh, aspects of that and create industry, create jobs, create economy, and have fun with space exploration. Um, so we at NASA, if you go to nasa.gov slash win it, that is our website. And it advertises all the different competitions that we have going on. So we're doing competitions with CubeSats. We're doing competitions with autonomous robots. Um, we're looking to do competitions here shortly um, with robots and rockets together. So we have a, a pretty broad portfolio. In the past, we've done competitions with electric aircraft. We've done competitions with wireless transmission of power. And in particular, we've done competitions trying to design a better astronaut glove. So for some of you that aren't too familiar, uh, for astronauts, when they go out on an EVA, an extravehicular activity, a lot of times you'll be in, you're in your suit and it's pressurized. So when you get into the vacuum of space, it's as if you blew up um, just a, a rubber glove. And if you have, take a rubber glove and you, you, you pull the finger back and you let it go, twang, and it just goes back and it keeps trying to go straight. Well, when an astronaut is in his spacesuit and he's trying to grip around a tool, he's having to resist that every single time. And as he does that over and over and over for eight hours, for 10 hours, there's some sort of instances where an astronaut would come back in and they'd have bloody fingertips because of having to deal with that resistance. And so we had a competition to create a glove that was less resistance to flex, well, to uh, squeeze your hand in. Um, and that's what Ted engaged in. So that was our astronaut glove competition. And I would actually love for you to talk a little bit about your experience with that, Ted. Yeah, um, thank you, Sam, so much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, I wish I had a lot more time to talk about uh, everything that um, the Centennial Challenges has done, both for me, but also for a whole bunch of other people that I'm, that I'm friends with. Um, but whenever you ask me to come out, I try to make an effort to do it, because I think it's a great story. Uh, what I've gone through, through the Centennial Challenges. I first got involved back even before you were with the Centennial Challenges. We have a storied history at NASA. Um, but for me, it's been a really, um, a whole new path 
for my life, essentially, after the Centennial Challenges. I um, moved to New York about 14 years ago and started making props and costumes at a prop shop in Chelsea. I uh, made wings for Victoria's Secret and stuff for Broadway shows and TV. Um, and uh, ended up going back to graduate school and I got a master's in fine arts. And as I was doing that, I found out about NASA's first, the 2007 Astronaut Glove Challenge. And everything I'd done in graduate school had to do with hands, and somehow this challenge just spoke to me in exactly what I was interested in. So I actually entered it as an artist. And uh, I didn't win in 2007, uh, but I learned a lot and uh, met, at that point, my competitor, now my partner. And we paired up for the 2009 Astronaut Glove Competition, which had more rules. In 2007, they were just concerned about the pressure garment. In 2009, they actually incorporated an outer garment, the TMG. And uh, Nick and I ended up winning second place in the 2009 glove competition down at the Astronaut Hall of Fame in Titusville, Florida. Uh, we won $100,000 from NASA. And um, that could have been the end of the story. Um, just, you know, but, but it gets a lot better. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, it was, it was kind of remarkable to me that NASA really did, was interested in what we had come up with almost immediately upon winning. We were invited to headquarters in DC and we participated in a conference of other Centennial Challenge winners. I, won, I met uh, George Maston from Maston Space Systems and uh, several other people in the industry. And from there, we were invited to Houston to the Johnson Space Center to show our technology to astronaut technicians there in Houston. Uh, from there, we started a business, uh, my partner Nikolai and I, and um, started contracting with NASA. So we've been through three NASA contracts, three small business innovation research um, contracts over the last three years, and, um, and have since become a commercial entity. So we have several uh, commercial partners in the new space industry that we're either partnered with or selling spacesuits to. Um, and in addition to that, we're starting to roll out more of a spin-off uh, terrestrial oriented technology. So right now we're doing a lot of research and development on fireman's gloves in particular, but we're also interested in sensor systems, liquid cooling garments, a lot of stuff that you find in spacesuits, but are also actually useful on Earth. So something you mentioned, um, you, the competition started, you did a glove, and now you're talking spacesuits. Right. Yeah, so we went almost immediately from gloves to spacesuits. I feel very lucky um, to work with my partner Nikolai, who worked in Russia, actually, at, at Zvezda, the Russian spacesuit provider, for almost 20 years. Um, but uh, getting back to the original point, uh, I think that it's a, such an amazing story for me because here I was, an artist, uh, working in costuming, and I had kind of a direct interface with NASA, a way to, to talk and show what new ideas I had about how one particular technology could work uh, without any um, problems. You know, it was, it was very easy to say, well, this is what I have and this is what I can do. Not easy, I wouldn't say easy, but uh, it, it was an, a public interface. And uh, to that extent, I, I feel like it's, it's an opening to all kinds of people to, um, as I put it earlier, interface with what is traditionally the uh, military industrial complex. And you know, all of my competitors, my serious competitors I consider are the ones that have previously contacted with NASA. And uh, they are used to working with the Army, the DOD, uh, and that's the sort of um, you know, large scale comp competitors that I'm up against. And here I am, you know, I originally started as a guy in a garage, literally. Um, so I, I just think it's quite an amazing story that um, that there was that support afterwards from NASA and uh, and I think it's it's a tremendous opportunity for a lot of people. The the citizen inventor challenge model is one that's been around for a long time from you know early aviation and I think uh, the early watches were um, founded on uh, sort of the same model of a citizen inventor challenge. And as Sam put earlier, it's um, there's a shot in our studio. This is a, um, a launch position flight simulator that we've uh, built recently to do some testing with our suit. Uh, we at, th at this point, we've built five spacesuits, and uh, we are there's one in Spain now, actually doing test flights on a high altitude balloon, um, and we're working with some fighter jet people down at KSC, the um, the star fighters uh, at KSC. So. Uh, there, it's been a tremendous opportunity, and uh, I'm grateful for it, and I'm happy to answer any questions uh, about the, the challenges and, and to promote them. Cool. So we'll, we'll do some questions here at the very end. Um, so we went from that where we did just prize competitions, um, where Ted entered the competition and came out uh, in 
a, a double winner in this case, I think. So it won our competition and was able to go off and take advantage of that. So there's a lot, a lot of other opportunities. He had mentioned that uh, he's been receiving SBIR, Small Business Initiative Research uh, Grants and opportunities there. And then, um, Matt, why don't you talk a little bit about some other opportunities that we have also? Yeah. So um, one of the, the key things, particularly I'm from Silicon Valley, the uh, NASA Ames Research Center, is um, there's a lot of people who are interested in um, how to work with NASA, how to make things for NASA, um, or actually make some of the things that NASA has. So one of the things that uh, the Office of the Chief Technologist has developed um, in response to actually Congress's demand that we um, that the agency commercialize uh, the technology um, is is a roadmap. Actually, uh, the oversight committee that looks at what NASA should be doing created a roadmap um, to respond to the technological needs that the, uh, the agency needs to explore space. Um, and so, at the uh, NASA.gov OCT website, there's this list of technologies, and and I'm going to actually read them off because it's it's really that important to know the kinds of things that they're looking for. Uh, launch propulsion systems are um, uh, from the ground, but also in space propulsion systems. There are examples of uh, uh, college students that are working on these very interesting propulsion systems for small satellites. These are being developed outside the agency, but being brought in. Um, space power and energy storage. It's important to be able to you know, store the energy for the spacecraft for satellites, equally as important for our phones and for things on the ground. Robotics, telerobotics and autonomous systems. Uh, communications and navigation systems, human health, life support, and habitation systems. All of these things don't immediately sound like space, but all of these things, uh, are the space technology application is specific to what we need, but you can imagine their, their benefits are here on the ground. Um, human exploration destination systems, science instruments, observatories, and sensor systems. These are the kinds of things that do get into the space-specific uh, realm, which uh, turns on a lot of makers. The, you know, we've had exploration forever with the development of telescopes um, and satellites now, but uh, there are other things that researchers need that can be made. In fact, there are sensors on SparkFun that could be integrated that would make very good science applications that makers could make for NASA. Um, and then to go down to some of the higher tech stuff, things like entry, descent, and landing, nanotechnology, those are, uh, are specific to the agency in many ways, but then you have modeling, simulation, information technology, material structures, mechanical systems, um, and thermal management systems, and then of course the last is ground launch systems and so forth. A lot of these are specific again to the agency, but there's a lot of really good ideas out there among the maker community that we can certainly import. And so one of the things we like to do at, at, uh, across the agency, but especially in, at NASA Ames Research Center, is engage with people through the OCT website. We have these opportunities for you to reach out to um, uh, our, our technology portfolio and look through things that you might be interested in developing, or email works great. Uh, if you can just reach out and contact to, uh, uh, folks through the OCT website and through um, uh, other uh, contacts that you can find online. Even just reaching out to me, I can find uh, ways for you to uh, get involved. And so, um, with that, so I, I guess also within yeah. within the Space Technology Mission Directorate, we have uh, NASA's Innovative Advanced Concepts (NIAC). We have uh, SBIR. We have STTR, Space Technology. STTR. Research. Space, it's a technology, technology transfer. Transfer. Tech yeah. transfer. Yeah. That's yeah. Energy with the universities. Yeah. So with the universities. The so there's opportunities. Flight Opportunities Program, yeah, the FOPS. Uh, so right. Roses, the Research Opportunities in Space and Education Science, I think. Mm -hmm. So right? yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you, Ted, you, you've got it. So these are all the things that are, all on, about <laughs> that, acronyms. that are out there yeah. that uh, a maker that has an idea mm -hmm. that wants to try to get funding, if it's applicable within our technology roadmaps especially, but if you're looking to get funding to try to further advance the development of that technology, it's there. You know, the, the call for NIAC uh, comes out on an annual basis. SBIR comes out on an annual basis. SBIRs so all, come out in a month or in uh, November. Mm -hmm. So it's all FOPS available is there. Upcoming. FOPS is ongoing, I think, the Flight Opportunities, the flight opportunities Program. Is. That's a really interesting opportunity where you could potentially propose some manufacturing technique that would be useful only in microgravity and actually have your, your science uh, proposal fly in, in, NASA would pay for the funding. Yeah, and in fact, that's a, a great point to close on, too. Um, the Flight Opportunities Program have uh, microgravity opportunities and uh, things like Virgin Galactic, um, uh, uh, eventually x and other providers up aerospace where you can get uh, some microgravity time. They also manage a program called the Zero Gravity Corporation, which 
supported an SBIR for the 3D printer that's going to be launched this weekend to the International Space Station. In fact, I was very lucky to fly on that uh, aircraft with the, the guys from Made in Space. And so there, there's a classic example of makers actually making some hardware useful for the agency um, using the SBIR channel and using the Flight Opportunities Program. So I think we're just under five minutes. If anybody has questions, we'd be happy to entertain. Yep, right. Yep, green shirt. Well, that's just it. Um, we are your space agency. It's your tax dollars. So anything that has been developed by NASA is uh, open, open source to the, to the public. If it was created uh, by a contract with a contractor, that IP would generally reside with that contractor, so that wouldn't be available to be given away. But if it's NASA technology, by all means, that, that's actually uh, fully available. And I know right now we're looking through a process to um, collate all of our uh, patents into one location that's a searchable database so that people could go through and look to see what we have to find it to take advantage of that technology. I think uh, the, the Tech Briefs also has an interface with NASA that has particular IP uh, oversight. So you yeah. could contact via NASA Tech Briefs. There's like several email addresses on there that you can ask specifically about IP. And these are all Googleable terms. You can find them if you look for NASA patents or NASA Tech Briefs. These are things that you can easily get access to. One more, perhaps? Yeah. So the question is, during the competition, does NASA hold any of the IP? And the answer is no. Uh, during a competition, the IP remains with the competitor themselves. Uh, we do regain the right to negotiate in good faith to have access to use that IP. but. Um, by all means, we have no oversight in the competitions. We don't force you into any uh, processes. We just oh, we provide the opportunity to uh, to compete. Fair statement, Ted. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, I, the, I I'm always impressed by that mo model, and I think that's been incorporated into the COTS program as well, where um, NASA is just looking for technologies that can meet their needs. They're not interested in, in owning the IP per se, although they would like access. And, and COTS is commercial off the shelf. Yep, yep. So easy stuff. So thank you all very, very, very much for uh, being here today. Um, <laughs> we're here all weekend. Uh, so we, we will have a booth over at Maker Fair. So if you have the opportunity to come by and we have other questions that you think of later on, please absolutely stop by our booth and grab us. So I'll also be here um, for the rest of our club. Most importantly, I'll be over at the Kickstarter booth, so I'll oh, see you guys at NASA. Fantastic. So have a great con. Enjoy the day.